بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم The Crusaders are going to conquer Jerusalem as well. When they arrive, they've, they've actually been traveling through the Middle East up until that point. They had captured several cities, and every time they would capture it, they would talk the defenders into surrendering. And every time they would talk them into surrendering, they would line them up and then do mass executions. So when they get to Jerusalem, they've got the problem. They're not a desert army. They, can't, they don't know how to do a desert siege. They've got the problem of running the water from the Jordan River, and they're, they're holding out, hoping that God will intercede and help them, and God does. Um, the Genovese sent siege equipment. They didn't have any siege equipment. They didn't know how to get over the walls. So they're stuck. They actually attacked a couple of times with nothing. <laughs> and they get to the wall, and the Arabs are like, I don't, I don't know if this is moral, shooting arrows at them. And then um, finally they get the siege equipment because God told Genoa to send siege equipment. And they, they attack the city again, and they capture a piece of the outer wall. There was an inner wall and an outer wall. They capture a piece of the outer wall. And they go to the Arabs, and they nego- try to negotiate. And the Arabs are like, you know what? Go to hell. We know you're just going to kill everybody after you get us to surrender. You've done it how many times? You did it at Antioch. You know, this is your pattern. We, we're not going to surrender to you. We'll fight to the death. It's preferable. And the, Ar- and the Crusaders go, look, we'll make you a deal. Leave 10 at a time. That way, if we betray anybody, we just kill those 10 guys. So it's not worth it to us to betray, because what's the point in killing those 10 guys? Because if, if you still have the citadel inside the city, you we'll still won't control it. So it doesn't do us any good. And they actually talk the Egyptian defenders into leaving this way. So they go 10 at a time, and they just run out the city. And eventually, the last Egyptian defenders, the last 10, you've got to figure they're going to die, but they didn't. They got away. They leave, and the Crusaders go, and they close the gates. And they walk over to the Muslim quarter, and they whip out their swords, and they begin murdering everybody. Crusader accounts say that the slaughter in the Muslim quarter was so bad that there was blood flowing at knee level in the gutters. I I have to think that has to be an exaggeration. I can't comprehend that much blood. But... You know, this is the Crusader account saying this. So there, there, there must have been some truth to it. There must have been blood in the gutter, at least. Um, the Muslims realized that they, it was over, they were going to die. So they began running to the mosques, thinking that they could die in the act of prayer. Maybe that would help their chances with God. And the Crusaders would just bat, use battering rams and smash the mosque door open and murder everybody inside. And then they went to the tops of the mosques and they broke the crescent moons off and then replaced them with crosses and instantly had churches. Then they went to the Jewish quarter. And um, so this, you know, the Arabs were ruled by Muslims, but they were Jews and they were Christian Arabs. And Jerusalem was two Christian quarters, a Muslim quarter and a Jewish quarter. They go to the Jewish quarter and they began murdering the Jews. And, the, you know, the Jews realize, okay, we've seen this story so many times. So they start running to synagogues to pray. So that, that can be their last act is prayer in a synagogue. And the crusaders don't smash the doors open. They just pile wood around the synagogues and light them on fire and burn the Jews to death inside. And the reason was is because the crusaders believed that Jews were so horrible, such horrible beings, that there was no way to cleanse and purify a synagogue and turn it into a church. Um, The crusaders actually began the crusades in 1096 by murdering 9,000 Jewish Germans living along the Rhine River. So, you know, like, that was their way of getting favor with Jesus before setting off to do this. Um, They then went to the two Christian quarters. And of course, at this point, the Christians in Jerusalem don't know what to expect. And the Crusaders go, the clergy and the lay people who are, you know, the deacons need to step out. And so they do, and the Crusaders execute them. They mass execute all the clergy and the lay people. And it's because they were the wrong kind of Christian. The great schism had just happened in 1058. These were Orthodox Christians and the Crusaders were Catholics. 
And then they appointed the German and French uh, priests that they had with them to be the new priests of Jerusalem. And they went, now you are all now Catholic. Um, the Romans have largely abandoned it. The Roman military has. But there's enough people manning the walls that you can't get in. So the Arab army is stuck outside trying to figure out how to get inside so they can capture this holy city. The Archbishop of Jerusalem, a man named Sophronius, by the way, a Christian Arab, a loyal Roman citizen, indicates he's willing to negotiate, but only with Omar ibn al-Khattab, the Khalif. Well, the Khalif is all the way back in Mecca It'll be weeks before he can be sent for and then return. Sophronius comes out of the gates weeks later to meet the Caliph because he sees the Caliph's army arrive. And as he's approaching, he sees a man leading a camel at the front of the army. So for the record, the rich Arabs, the Arabs who were good soldiers, didn't usually ride camels. They usually rode horses. Arabians, and for those of you who don't know, Arabians are fast and agile, and they have crazy personality. And so they're, they're perfect for warfare. Camels are a little bit clumsy and slow. They serve a purpose in warfare, but you're better off on an Arabian. In any case, the Arab army is being led by a man leading a camel with a man on the camel. So Sophronius, he's got a giant red hat, because he's also a cardinal, right? He's got gold tassels, actual gold, hanging from his hat. He's covered in gold jewelry. He's wearing red robes. He's covered in perfume. He's on a lectica. The lectica was the couch that the Romans would ride, and then they'd have like four or eight men, depending how big it is, carrying it. And then he has two men, one on each side, fanning him. Of course, right? That's what Jesus would want from his bishops. It's exactly right. And he's coming out on this lectica being fat. And he comes up to the guy on the camel and he says, uh, where's the caliph? And the guy on the camel does like this. He nods with his head at the guy leading the camel. So Sophronius turns to the guy leading the camel and goes, where's the caliph? And the guy leading the camel says, I'm the caliph. And Sophronius goes, dude, you're dressed in rags. The guy's pants were, ha were mended multiple times, his shirt was mended multiple times, and he goes, no, no, I'm the caliph. And Sophronius goes, you've just conquered Iraq and Syria and all of Palestine minus Jerusalem. How is it you're so poor? And the caliph goes, well, why would I collect wealth? I'm, we're not doing this war because I'm trying to plunder anything. I'm a humble man with humble needs. I just need good meal. And then Sophronius goes, why aren't you riding the camel? And Omar goes, uh, that's my servant on the camel. And we take turns so that neither one of us gets exhausted. At this point, Sophronius is like, oh, what? Who just conquered us? What are these Marxists? And so Sophronius gets off the lectica <laughs> because he's shamed off of the thing. And he says, okay, uh, I, I want to talk to you about our surrendering the city to you. And, and, and the caliph says, I have an idea. Let's walk to the city and I'll tell you what I was thinking the terms would be. And then, and then so we'll start there. And so Fornis goes, yes, of course. And as they're walking, Omar ibn al-Khattab says, why don't we do this? All Roman politicians leave Jerusalem. You just go if you're a politician. So if you're a top bureaucrat, a, an officer, and you can take anything you can carry. So you can take gold, as long as you can carry. And Sophronius goes, okay. Uh, I mean, that's reasonable. That's actually more than reasonable. I, I just assumed you'd enslave them and take their gold. <laughs> I, don't, I don't see how anybody would be mad about that. 
And then what else? And the caliph goes, oh no, I was thinking that's it. Uh, we, we don't do anything else. And Sophronius goes, wait a minute, I am really confused. So when us Romans capture a city, we enslave a segment, we plunder the city, probably a little bit too much raping too. We might even burn some of it, just for grins and giggles. And then we declare it to be ours. What about that? And Omar al-Khattab, Ibn al-Khattab goes, no, 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 we're not going to do any of that. No plundering, no raping, no enslaving. We don't do that stuff. And then Sophronius goes, oh, but you're going to like seize property in the city. And, so, and the Caliph goes, no, no, we're not going to take anybody's property. We're going to leave the city exactly like it is. The only thing I want to do is eject the Roman politicians with whatever they can carry. And Sophronius goes, there's nothing to negotiate. Yeah, we surrender the city this instant. <laughs> I, I don't understand, actually. They walk into the city. Khalid is one of the men following. Amr ibn al-As, all these guys, they're on foot. If, if they've got their horses with them, they're leading their horses by the reins, right? Because the leadership is on foot. There's no way they're going to ride in. <laughs> they're walking. And this is a holy city to them because Jesus is holy to them, because the Jews were holy to them. And so they, they see this as a holy city. Sophronius goes, tell me about your religion as they're walking through the streets. And so Omar ibn al-Khattab starts telling him about Islam. Sophronius goes, it just sounds like a variation of Christianity. I, I feel like our religions are shockingly similar. And Omar ibn al-Khattab goes, yeah, because they are. I mean, we thought we were doing uh, Judaism 3.0. It never occurred to us that we were going to be received as being so different. And uh, he goes, okay, since you've given us such amazing surrender terms, my alarm, because I feel such kinship with your religion, will you do me an honor? Will you come to my church and pray in your Muslim way next to me as I pray in my Christian way? And Omar ibn al-Khattab goes, never. And Sophronius goes, why? He goes, I'm the Khalif. The first place I pray in Jerusalem is going to become a mosque. The Muslims will take it and they will create a place of worship for Muslims and you will lose it. And I don't want you to lose your church. And Sophronius goes, oh, uh, okay. What if we find an empty piece of Jerusalem and we just pray there? And Omar go, Ibn al-Khattab goes, yes, I accept. An empty piece, something that nobody owns. So they go and they find an empty lot and they pray. The Archbishop in his Christian way, the Caliph in his Muslim way, side by side. It is a mosque today, that spot commemorating the first place that the first Muslim Khalif prayed in, in Jerusalem. He nailed it. He, he knew what was coming. And he saved the Church of the Holy Sepulchre for Christians because that's the church Sophronius wanted him to pray in. At that point, the Khalif says, I want to see the Temple Mount. And Sophronius goes, why? And the Khalif goes, because it's holy. It's holy to everybody. It's holy to Christians, it's holy to Jews, it's holy to Muslims. And Sophronius goes, nah, we haven't been treating it as holy to anybody. And Omar ibn al-Khattab goes, what do you mean? And so Sophronius says, so after we tore down the second temple of Solomon, when we conquered Palestine, we turned the Temple Mount into a garbage dump to punish the Jews. And, so, and the Khalif goes, what do you mean? And Sophronius goes, yeah, we've been, there's like 500 years of refuse on that thing. It's just a garbage dump. And he goes, show me. They walk up to the Temple Mount and the Khalif can't believe what he's looking at. He falls on his knees and he begins clearing the garbage by his hands. His army sees their leader on his knees clearing garbage and they run up and they start clearing the garbage themselves and they clear the garbage off the Temple Mount. The Caliph goes, okay, 
I want to meet some of the Jews living in Jerusalem. And Sophronius goes, there are no Jews in Jerusalem. And the Caliph goes, what do you mean there's no Jews in Jerusalem? The city is holy to the Jews. How could there be no Jews? And he says, well, us Christians, we pretty much murder them every chance we get. We really hate Jews. In fact, in the war we just did against the Persians, the Jews sided with the Persians. And so we murdered 20,000 Jews in Jerusalem and completely purged the city of its remaining Jewish population. And Omar ibn al-Khattab goes, no, this is wrong. You can't do this. And so he turns to a convert to Islam, a Jewish convert to Islam, and he says, I need you to find me 80 Jewish families that were willing to volunteer to move to Jerusalem so we can reestablish a Jewish presence in this city. And that's how the Muslims conquered Jerusalem. And that's the stuff that's left out of your history books. Isn't that crazy? Because isn't that an amazing story? <laughs>